Markets are going crazy as the meme gurus over at Reddit.com confound the entire financial and regulatory establishment. But the establishment is pushing back big tech, big government, big corporate America, all coming back to squeeze the little guy. We'll get into what it all means. This is Verdict with Ted Cruz. Welcome back to Verdict. I'm Michael Knowles. I am joined by the nefarious, infamous murderer himself, Ted Cruz. We have got some very, very exciting news. After so long of being locked down, of being kept apart, we're taking Verdict on the road. We will be at YAF's Freedom Conference in Miami, Friday, February 5th, 8 p.m. Eastern. If you're in Miami, I hope that we'll see you there. Even if you're not in Miami, We will get to speak with you. We will be taking your questions live through the YAF YouTube channel. So if you want to submit a question and have it answered in real time, go to youtube.com slash YAF TV. We have been talking about a whole lot of things, but there's so much more to get to. Senator, what are we going to talk about? Well, the best thing about Miami is that we'll be with with real live human beings out of the, the COVID caves to which we've all been sent. Uh, you had to flee the state of California to actually encounter other human beings. And so it'll be good to be in Florida, an actual state that is open and operating with, with live, liberty-loving human beings. And, and apparently I will continue my murderous rampage down in Miami. <laughs> Yet, you know, ever since Northern California in the 60s, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, I've had a proclivity to, 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 be, to mass murder, and so, uh, so yes. we'll see if that continues. You got that. Again, this actually, the, the most recent accusation of your murderous tendencies, uh, it came in response to this, this GameStop wild stock market question. I, I know some people are a little confused by what's been going on in the markets, and by some people, I especially mean me. I, I, I'm not exactly the most financially literate person here. What exactly is going on? There, there's, as far as I can tell, there are these guys on Reddit who decided that there was a vulnerability at some big hedge fund, and Wall Street had taken out certain positions, and so they were going to make a bunch of money at Wall Street's expense, and then everything went haywire. Well, I think you actually understand it pretty well. Uh, You had a couple of big Wall Street hedge funds uh, that were short selling GameStop. So they were making bets in the market uh, that GameStop was going to go down. And if the stock price went down, they made a bunch of money. And over at at Reddit, uh, at this this subreddit called Wall Street Bets, uh, a bunch of folks got ticked off at that and said, I'll tell you what, let's all go buy GameStop. And number one, we'll make money and drive the stock up. But number two, we'll put those other guys out of business. And miraculously, they got enough people to do it that the stock started going up and going up and going up. And it went from like four bucks a share to I think it's been as high as as, as $400 a share. I mean, it's massive increase. I, I checked a few minutes ago. It's trading about 318 right now. That is enormous volatility. Uh, that did did a number of things. Number one, for everyone that bought it four bucks, if you sold it four hundred, you made a lot of money. Uh, yeah. Number two, the hedge funds that are betting on it going down. I mean, they got caught with their shorts down, and they are really, really unhappy. Because Senator, when you when you take a, a short position, or when you're short selling a, a stock, you you're betting against it, right? And so you know if it goes down, you make money. But if it if it goes up. It's not like you get to just hold your position in midair forever. You've, you've got to start putting cash on the table as the stock goes up. So what has happened is if you're shorting it, you have sold the stock at a really low price. And you've already executed that transaction. You've sold it. And so if the stock goes up, you have to fulfill on that promise, which means you got to buy it. Let's say you sold it at 3 bucks. You might have to buy it at 400 to be able right. to deliver on the stock you sold at 3 in other words, when, when, when you're shorting a, a, a stock, you've got enormous vulnerability if, there, if there's a big delta on the upside. And right. so this, uh, look, this is chaotic. This is, this is disconcerting. But, but then it took a really, I, I got to say, screwed up step uh, because a number of trading platforms, most prominently Robinhood, you know, Robinhood popularized itself as democratizing stock sales that you on your phone can participate with the big boys. Well, suddenly Robinhood decided, no, no, you can't. 
Uh, the big boys, they can still buy and sell, but, but you, the, the ordinary schmo, they prevented you uh, from buying GameStop. You could still sell it. You just couldn't buy it. <laughs> It's unbelievable. And, and I got to admit, a whole lot of folks, a whole lot of folks on the left, a whole lot of folks on the right, I mean, we all said, all right, this is screwed up. If there's going to be a rule, it ought to be a rule that applies to everyone. We shouldn't have one rule for rich, powerful, connected hedge funds in Manhattan and a different rule for every other American that, that is trading your own money. And, and what Robin Hood did is basically implemented that rule and said, all right, we're, we're going to screw the little guy and, and, and only favor the big guy. And that does seem to be getting the whole notion of Robin Hood a little bit backwards. <laughs> yeah, steal from the poor to give to the rich. Be because one thing that has been so nauseating about this entire issue is, is when, when apps like Robin Hood came in and uh, protected Wall Street, basically protected these hedge funds, it was as though they were these vulnerable, innocent Poor little hedge funds, you know, and the, the mean old guys on Reddit were coming in. And of, of course, that isn't the case when you've got a retail investor, an ordinary American coming in, trying to play with the big guys. And then the big guys seem to get this separate set of rules here. Uh, so uh, the left and the right did kind of come together about this. They said, this seems a little bit rigged, guys. This seems unfair. AOC, as far left a congressman as you can get, she came out and said, we've got to look into this. You said, you know, a uh, stopped clock twice a day. I, I, I agree with this. And it could have been this moment of unity and healing and bipartisan support. And then she called you a murderer. Yeah. So, so my tweet, I took her tweet where she said, this is messed up. This needs to be investigated. Congress needs to look into why Robin Hood shut down ordinary investors, but, but hedge funds can continue to try to get out of their, their short position and try to cover their rear ends. Um, I read her tweet, and I was, you know, on my phone. I read it, and I said, "Huh, that's right. I'll, I'll be damned. That doesn't happen very often." And so yeah. I retweeted her, and the the sum total of my tweet was two words: "Fully agree." Uh, and then I had a finger pointing down. And by the way, no, it was not the middle finger. It was the the index finger pointing down. In an ordinary world, if someone retweets you and say they fully agree with you, that does suggest, gosh, maybe there's there's something to this. If people all across the ideological spectrum agree this is screwed up, maybe there's something to it. Her reaction was a little different. She sent a series of, of, of really unhinged tweets, screaming that, that, that she's not willing to work with me. She'll work with other Republicans, although I'm not sure who or where, but, but yeah. <laughs> this theoretical Republican, but because I tried to have her murdered three weeks ago, she's not mm -hmm. willing to work with me. And it's just, uh, look, the left right now, they're angry. They're filled with hate, and, and, and they're, they're exercising a primal scream. I mean, we are seeing id right now, leftist id, and they're expressing hate. And it's like, all right, look, our country is really divided right now. I'd like to see us actually interact like human beings and adults and, and, and show some decency and, and, and actually address the real problems in the country, but... On the other hand, you can just scream, screw you, screw you, screw you, if, the, if that's what makes you feel good. Well, this brings up a conversation that's happening right now among conservatives as, as all of these kind of big powers, big, 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 are yep. coming in and clamping down. It, it's making us rethink some things, I think, because as you say, AOC says, well, I'm happy to work with Republicans, just not Ted Cruz and just not Donald Trump and just not really any Republican who, who could work with her. You know, it's just this hypothetical Republican. But, but basically, she's delegitimizing any Republican. You've heard this from other people on the left who say 75 million Americans are Nazi, white supremacist, whatever. And we on the right used to say things like, well, you know, Twitter is a private company. If they want to kick people off, build your own Twitter. You know, we, we want private people to be able to run their business however they want. Uh, but increasingly, we're finding out the left won't let us build our own Twitter. Mm. We, we tried to do that with, with an app called Parler. They kicked it out of the app store. Then they kicked it off the internet. Same thing here. Uh, are we now, if, if we're not allowed to invest in Robinhood, or through Robinhood rather, or really any of the other brokerage apps, are we supposed to build our own broker dealer? Or are we supposed to build our own stock market? Are we supposed to build our own economy? You know, wh where is the right. end of this? And, and how can we tackle the problem so that we're not totally ostracized from society? 
So there's a whole bunch of substance there to unpack. Let me, let me take that at, at, at several levels. Number one, if you look at what happened to Parler, Parler was kicked out of existence by essentially every gigantic tech company acting in concert. So it was, so it was Apple and Amazon and all of them just said, we're shutting down your servers, we're kicking you off. And, and it, was, it was swift, it was brutal, it was obviously illegal. By the way, when giant competitors work together to eliminate another competitor, that is on its face an antitrust violation and they're all gonna be sued, they're all gonna pay big damages and they don't care. They're so big and, and mm. they're now convinced the Biden administration are so in their pocket that they just don't care. It's an exercise of brute power. Secondly, you know, the AOC response is, is typical of how the left responds to a lot of issues, which is they don't actually wanna talk substance. They don't actually wanna, wanna talk about the underlying merits. They want to engage, number one, it's all politics. You know, we talked in the last uh, verdict about how this is the final scene from every Godfather movie, that they are playing out Michael Corleone, they are settling the debts, they want you and me and all of us to sleep with the fishes. And, and so they are trying to eliminate everyone. They're trying to eliminate Donald Trump, they're trying to eliminate me, they're trying to eliminate you, they're trying to eliminate conservatives on, on, on social media. They're trying to erase the 75 million Americans who voted for Trump. And, and, and it is completely devoid of substance. Now, you talked about how does that mean we can't, um, you know, the ordinary American can't can invest, say, in GameStop through Robinhood. Look, one important caveat. GameStop is almost surely a terrible investment. Right, right. Um, and it's worth noting. I mean, there are, I mean, since there have been investments, since there's been stock markets, there have been bubbles. You know, you look at in, in Holland, the tulip bulbs, where they bid up tulip bulbs to insane <laughs> amounts. Now, anytime you have a bubble, anytime you have prices going way, 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 way up, you can make a ton of money. If you buy at 100 and sell at 200, that math works really well. So if you happen to catch something that is soaring on an artificial bubble, if you can time it right, you can make a good chunk of money. Now, people get worried about bubbles because if you buy at 1,000 and it drops to two, you can be devastated. And, and predictably with giant bubbles, these, they, they soar high and then they crash precipitously. So I'll be honest, I'm not buying GameStop right, right, right yeah, now. Me neither. I, I, me neither. Uh, I think it is fair to say GameStop is not today a $70 billion company, which is where its market <laughs> cap was, uh, g given that it was a tiny fraction of that a couple of weeks ago. I mean, this is, this is a casino. So there are people rightly saying, look, a lot of people could lose their shirt and lose all their money on this. And that's right. But the same rules ought to apply for everyone. So if it's a casino, you know what? You or I can walk into a casino in Vegas. We can put everything we got on red, spin the wheel, and if it hits, it hits. And what dismayed so many people, what I think was wrong, and what so many other people think was wrong about what Robin Hood did, is it had differential rules. The giant hedge funds, they could keep buying and selling, but ordinary Americans couldn't. And yes, there's risk, but if you wanna do some dumbass things, you ought to have as much right to do a dumbass thing <laughs> as the politically well-connected are. And that differential is significant. And a final point that is not being discussed at all, and, and uh, I'm sure AOC, this has not occurred to her remotely, uh, but there's a very real possibility that, that one of the major reasons that Robin Hood halted the ability of consumers uh, to buy GameStop is because of Dodd-Frank, because of leftist hmm. regulation that came in. So as a broker, uh, under Dodd-Frank, Robin Hood has a requirement essentially to put up funding and to borrow funding to cover the differential of their risk exposure. And it's set up uh, in such a way, and listen, I am, uh, I, I'm a lawyer, I don't do math, so I'm, I'm not gonna purport to explain the mechanics of it, other than I think there are good discussions to be had about how much was Robin Hood's actions driven by Dodd-Frank and pressure from the regulators? Did the regulators get involved directly? Did Janet Yellen, the new treasury secretary, did she get involved directly? That's a question that needs to be asked. What did the banking regulators do? Uh, and also, 
the fear of lawsuits. I don't doubt that a reason, a significant reason Robin Hood did this is they said, well, gosh, a whole bunch of people are going to buy the stock really high. It's going to plummet. They're going to lose all their money and they're going to turn around and sue us. Um, and, and they were hmm. understandably scared about being sued. And so there is, if we're going to let people go to a casino and bet, uh, it does seem to me there ought to be some form of basically a liability waiver, which is, you yeah. know, you sign something saying, you know, dumbass release. I recognize I may be being a dumbass right now. If I am, I'm not going to sue you. Yeah, that could yeah. well make sense. And, and I suspect our Democratic friends will have no interest in that because that does not conform with their ideology. Well, this I mean, this is a very important point that GameStop itself, right? This is a brick and mortar store that sells physical video games. This is a company that's going to go the way of Blockbuster. Uh, and, and these kind of uh, Reddit boards have also targeted BlackBerry, Nokia companies also were the technology. You know, they're, they're not the companies they once were. That was the point. I mean, they, it was kind of a joke to them. And they saw this massive short position and they they saw that they could basically run the price up and force these hedge funds that they don't like to, to buy up the stock. And, you know, it becomes a bubble. Some people are going to make a lot of money. Some people are going to get hurt. And it, the es establishment is going to expose itself. To me, what's so interesting about all this volatility is a political point that you've been making now for quite some time. And we're seeing it expressed. The guys on these Reddit boards, I don't know them personally. It seems their politics are a little more on the right than they are on the left. I've been told my whole life that the Republicans are the party of Wall Street. Republicans are the party of the big hedge funds. Republicans are the party of these plutocrats and the establishment. And yet, if you look right now, who is defending this sort of unfair set of rules that's protecting Wall Street? It's the establishment Democrats. It's yep. not the Republicans. We're the ones who are complaining about it. Is, is this shift, we've been talking about the difference between the party of Paris and the party of Pittsburgh. Is this shift settling in and are, are people going to realize it? Uh, yes, it's settling in and it drives Democrats crazy. Um, you are right. Today's Democratic Party is the party of the rich. It's the party of elites. It's the party of Wall Street. It's the party of big tech. It's the party of Hollywood. It's the party of universities. That's, that's who big tech listens to. Uh, that, that's who rather Democrats listen to. See, I can't even tell the difference between big tech and Democrats anymore. It's actually one of the reasons why today's Democrats are so pro-China, why they're so in bed with communist China, because hmm. all of their patrons all of the people writing them checks and funding what they're doing are in bed with China. Big tech, Hollywood, they're in bed with China, which means the Democrats are in bed with China. Who are the Democrats not supporting? Working men and women, blue collar workers, union members. You know, you mm -hmm. think back, you know, you and I both read in history books, neither one of us are old enough to remember FDR, but, but there was a time where FDR were, were union workers. Uh, a steel worker was the prototypical Democrat voter. Yeah. And, and, and actually, you know, you look at Joe Biden. Joe Biden's whole political career has been marketing that he was the kid from Scranton, that he was the blue collar working class kid from Scranton. And what does he do? He gets elected and literally within minutes of being sworn in, he takes out a pen and he destroys thousands upon thousands of blue collar union jobs. Just the Keystone Pipeline, which he eliminated with one executive order, that was 11,000 jobs. 11,000 jobs, 8,000 of those were union jobs. And with the stroke of one pen, 11,000 people, their jobs just poof, go away. And, you know, I've spent the last couple of weeks in confirmation hearings for Biden cabinet appointees asking them, what do you say to those 11,000 people whose jobs you just destroyed? And the answer that they've said over and over again is essentially jump in a lake. Um, you know, we saw this week John Kerry, which mm. I got to say, by the way, if you were to pick the perfect spokesperson to right. understand right. the travails of the blue collar working class, <laughs> uh, it is John Kerry with tuxedo and tails riding his windsurfer. And, and he really does. He gave this 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 lecture where he says, well, we're going to help them, quote, make better choices. Well, with all respect, John, screw you. You don't get to sit there with $800 million in the bank, which by the way, you didn't earn, and tell 
the lowly, dirty people who have to work for a living, we're going to help you make better choices. He said, they all need to make solar panels. You know, I would invite you, John, come to South Texas to the oil patch and talk to an Hispanic guy in a Ford F-150 and tell him, sorry, I don't like the choices you have, so your job has just been eliminated. Your ability to provide for your family is gone. I mean, the arrogance and condescension. Thurston Howell telling you, I'm destroying your life. Sadly, that's where the Democrats are right now. Well, there, there's something that was, I mean, the whole the whole Kerry press conference I felt was extraordinarily condescending and typically lockjawed and uh, and disturbing. But but the most disturbing aspect I, I felt was where he presented his political plan and the Biden administration's political plan as inevitable. And, you know, just a few months ago, Joe Biden was saying, I'm not against fracking, I'm not against coal, I'm not against oil, natural gas. And then we find out, you know, the rug is pulled out from under everybody. Yes, I am. We're going to kill the coal jobs. We're going to kill the the energy sector jobs. But it's inevitable. It's inevitable. You have to move to solar. You have to move to wind. Go learn how to fix a wind turbine. You know, it reminds us a few years ago when, when liberal journalists told American manufacturing workers – learn to code. Yep. Sorry. And as, as if there, there were no choice here. But of course there is. You know, the last four years, we had a different policy and we prioritized keeping energy jobs in America, bringing manufacturing jobs back. When we think about the difference between populism and elitism and all these isms that are coming up, what is the future for the Republican Party? And is there any way that we can stop this, this inevitable flow of progressive history? So let me make three points on that. Uh, Number one, you know, when Joe Biden was saying in the general election he wasn't going to end fracking, everyone knew he was lying. Biden knew he was lying. Trump knew he was lying. The press knew he was lying. Everyone listening knew he was lying. And what did the press do? And this is a great illustration of how we don't have journalism anymore. The press, the fact checkers, and by the way, fact checkers are among the most pernicious liars we have in our political process. The fact checkers declared it a lie if you said Biden was in fact going to ban fracking because he was lying to the American people and saying he wasn't. And we were required to accept his lies. Boom, what happens? He gets elected. And now the fact checkers are saying it's a lie that he ever said he wasn't going to ban fracking. I I mean, it is, uh, you know, I, I wish George Orwell or Aldous Huxley were still alive to see the absolute fluidity with which CNN and the Washington Post, they are able to tell the exact opposite lie on the flip of a switch without even the hint of of any recollection to what they were saying yesterday. Secondly, you know, when the John Kerry's of the world tell these poor, dirty, little working class people learn to code, you know what the ironies is? Almost inevitably, the politicians who are doing this, they don't know how to code. Yeah. <laughs> John Kerry doesn't know how to code. You, he could, I guarantee you can't program his iPhone. Like, like Joe Biden doesn't know how to code. You look at it, politicians are exercising power to destroy other people's lives. And one of the things the left loves to virtue signal, they love to show how virtuous they are by being willing to give away your job, never their job. Never a, mm-hmm. never a yeah. penny out of their pocket, never anything out of their life, but your job, they are so virtuous, they will obliterate your life. I, look, if you actually respect people, you say you ought to be able to choose what you want to do with your right life. Listen, I'm not a steel worker. If you put me in a steel foundry, I wouldn't think what the hell to do. I'd probably burn my fingers off. Like I, that, that, I, being a lawyer was the right call for me. That was my skill set. Yeah. But, but <laughs> I'm not going to presume to tell you that what you chose to do is, is somehow illegitimate and should be eliminated. The wrong choice. Well, yeah. And a third point, you know, you talked about inevitable. And, and I, I have to say it, it, it brought to mind Avengers Endgame. And, uh, you know, Kerry doesn't quite have the massive Thanos hands and fingers, but you could see <laughs> the inevitable in the finger snapping. And it actually... What is interesting, and Endgame is, is curious, have you noticed in how many movies 
how often rabid environmentalists are the bad guys. Hmm. Whether it's Thanos or, or go to Watchmen, you know, where, where, hmm. where the, 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 the view of the left is people are a disease. They buy into the Malthusian yeah. line that there are too many people yeah. in the world, that people are bad, and everything would be better if we had fewer people. I mean, Thanos wanted to eliminate 50% of the life forms in the universe with one finger snapping. And, I, you know, Senator, I don't want people to think that you're being hyperbolic here or that you're, you're – I mean, th this has been the, the explicit view of very prominent leftists for a long time. You're talking about the sort of Malthusian theories that, p that people are going to destroy the world. You saw this with the population bomb in the latter part of the 20th century where, where we were told by the top genius scientists that if we didn't have hopefully voluntary suppression of the global population, but if necessary, coerced – suppression of the global population. We'd inevitably have uh, starvation, famines everywhere. We had to do this. You hear this with, with very prominent environmentalists, up to and including Al Gore and others. It, it is a creepy point, and it seems so radical when you say it, but it is undeniable that that has been the position of prominent leftists. And, and, and Michael, I got a question for you. D do you own a private jet? Not yet, unfortunately. I, nor do I. Now, listen, I would love a private jet, but 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 I, I don't have one. Uh, you know who yeah. does own a private jet? John Friggin' Carey. Oh, my goodness, you don't say. So, so, so the same person, the hypocrisy on the left on this is really screwed up. I, and you, you yeah. see, uh, you know, you see Hollywood movie stars come in in their G5. They've got the carbon footprint of small towns. And are they willing to change how they travel? Oh, no, 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 no. John Kerry is going to fly in his jet. He's going to have a caravan of Suburbans carry him everywhere. He's perfectly happy to have a carbon footprint of, of Paul Bunyan. The rest of us, your jobs must go, to, go away. I'm sorry, learn something else to do. And, and it's, driven by, it's driven by money and it's driven by power. Listen, th this is not about climate. Y y you know, one of the, the weird things to understand, everything that Joe Biden is doing in the name of climate will make the climate dirtier. So as the Biden administration destroys U.S. oil and gas production, and that's what they're doing, they're trying to utterly destroy U.S. oil and gas production, you're not going to wake up tomorrow and magically have your car or truck in your driveway not need gasoline. You're not going to be able to put pixie dust in your car. You're still going to go to the gas station. You're going to fill the tank. So if, if Biden succeeds in destroying U.S. energy production, what does that mean? It means America is going to buy more oil and gas from the Middle East, from Russia. That does several things. Number one, it puts billions of dollars in countries that hate us and want to kill us. That's really bad. Why are we sending money to people who want us dead? But, but number two, they produce energy much dirtier than we do. So literally what mm. Biden is doing and what Kerry is doing is screwing the environment because they want to destroy American energy jobs because since they don't have a magic solution for what's going to power your car if you get on an airplane— and you and I, we don't get on our own private jets. We get on Southwest Airlines or whatever the commercial airline is. You know, jets don't operate on wind. It's really yeah. hard if you imagine putting, say, a, a windmill on the front of a jet. It just doesn't work. <laughs> no. You know, I'm not a physicist, but, but they're just kind of a problem with that. We're going to continue to have energy needs, but what they're doing is hurting the environment destroying jobs, and they're doing it for power and money. Every time you hear this, it's about power and money. Uh, the Keystone Pipeline, by the way, Keystone Pipeline, Biden just stopped. Keystone Pipeline would bring oil from Canada down south to the U.S. Without the Keystone Pipeline, you know what's happening? Well, we're still taking that oil. We're just driving it on trucks and trains. A dirtier way to transport it that's more expensive. So it doesn't actually, every step they're taking hurts the environment. Here is a data point that the listeners of Verdict will know because you all are engaged and, and educated, but, but it's worth underscoring because no Democrat will ever acknowledge it, which is what country had the single greatest reduction in carbon emissions last year in 2020? 
I think I have a, an idea who, yeah, uh, please give the answer. The United States of America, by far, right. it's not even right. close because our energy production is so much cleaner. And so literally what the Biden folks are doing is destroying yeah. the cleanest energy in the world to shift to dirtier energy because it makes California environmentalist billionaire donors happy. And, and that's, that doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, the tell on this, of course, is that the solutions that the left propose, they always remain the same, and their reasoning for why we need those solutions changes sometimes to the complete opposite. So, you know, in fa very famously, in the 1970s, we were hearing about the threat of global cooling and a new ice age, and today's environmentalists try to write this off and say, well, that was just a sort of media phenomenon, not, not within the scientific community. That isn't true. You can go back and see major scientific institutions warning about global cooling. That's where the media got it from. Then it changes to global warming. Uh, then it changes to the population bomb, as we were just discussing. Then it changes to, I don't know, climate crisis and they come up with all these new terms, no matter what the argument, it's always the same answer. Give more power to the state, give more power to the state's favored corporations, take away choice from, from Americans, tell them to thrive less, live less, do less. It always seems to be the same thing. And, you know, I guess this is related to the, to the power grab that you're seeing in the Biden administration. You see the same inevitability talk with regard to China. And China, a major polluter, let's not forget, you know, when we're talking about climate. But you heard from Biden and the kind of establishment consensus for decades. We need to support China, a rising China. It's a good thing for the world. Sure, we might lose some manufacturing jobs, but hey, there's, it's good. And even more than that, it's inevitable. Then we saw over the past few years, well, maybe it's not necessarily inevitable. Now we're hearing this again. Uh, I know the media are not reporting on these Biden nominees. They're not really reporting on Biden's stance toward China. You happen to be in the room. Yep. What can you tell us ab about, about that issue as it pertains to the new administration? Well, let me make two points. Let me comment on what you just said there because it was, it was very insightful. Um, but it's even worse than that, which mm -hmm. is the Democrats that purport to be motivated by a climate crisis – by their actions, have made clear they don't actually give a damn about the climate. Right. Like, like okay, if you're going to put forth that, that, that the criterion to judge success is are we protecting the environment, then under that criterion, the Democratic policies are a train wreck. They're a disaster. And, and this is where media narratives are exactly opposite. To be honest, if you look at which parties care about actually clean air and clean water, the record of success, every major environmental law in the past 50 years has been passed with a Republican president. The EPA was created with a Republican president. Right. If you look, at, you look at states like Texas with Republican leadership that clean the air and clean the water substantially improve. Look, all of us, we, we've got, we breathe, we drink water. Look, we have a responsibility to be good stewards of the environment. I want the world to be cleaner and better after we've left it than when we came. If you look at, separate the rhetoric of, of Democrats from their actions, the actions they're taking make the environment dirtier. If you're shifting from clean energy production in the U.S. to dirty energy production in Russia, if your criterion that matters more than anything is cleaning the environment, that is a stupid thing to do. Paris Climate Deal, and, and this connects to your China point. So Biden, opening week, rejoins the Paris Climate Deal. Paris Climate Deal is designed to destroy a whole bunch of high-paying jobs in the U.S., and it does virtually nothing on China. China is polluting right. like crazy. They, they, they are using dirty coal-powered production. They're dumping massive plastics in the rivers. By the way, I joined with a bunch of other Republicans in passing legislation to clean up the seas and to get plastics out of the seas, but a, an enormous percentage of that is coming from China and India that are dumping in rivers enormous quantities of, of plastic. The Democrats don't care about any of that. Their policies make it worse. So the Paris climate deal makes the environment dirtier. And, and the reason you can tell that they're not telling the truth is when you make this point, they don't care. They don't care. Yeah. It, it, right. the, they don't actually even dispute it. It doesn't matter because it's not about cleaning up 
the environment for them. It is about power. Their objective is to destroy those jobs because they want control and they want power. Now, you talked about China. In terms of big policy shifts, I think over the next four years, we're going to see a big, big shift towards embracing communist China. We've had multiple confirmation hearings for Biden cabinet nominees, one after the other after the other, has been moving back towards China. So, for example, Tony Blinken is the new Secretary of State. Blinken was asked if he would commit to maintain the entities list, the sanctioned companies in China who are participating in genocide, participating in, in repressing the Uyghurs, participating in, in big brother control of society. He wouldn't make that commitment. He, he said, no, I, I can't commit to that. Uh, Gina Raimondo, who's the governor of Rhode Island, she was nominated to be the Commerce Secretary. Um, I asked her at her confirmation hearing, I said, all right, will you co commit at least to Huawei? And we've talked about Huawei uh, on Verdict before. Huawei is this gigantic Chinese company. It is a global espionage company. It, it yeah, masquerades right. as a telecom company, but it's, it is the Chinese communist government uses Huawei to intercept communications from other countries and to engage in espionage. Huawei is currently listed. I asked Gina Raimondo, will you commit to, to leaving Huawei on the list? Nope, she can't commit to that either. She'd have to review it. Alejandro Mayorkas, who, who Biden has nominated to be the, the head of DHS, Department of Homeland Security. When he was at DHS before, he personally arranged for a visa for a senior vice president at Huawei uh, and for other big Democratic donors because Tony Rodham, Hillary Clinton's brother, arranged it, and he was basically in charge of making sure there were favors for big Democratic donors, including taking care of Huawei. There is a pattern across this, and I'll tell you this week, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, we had a confirmation hearing for Biden's nominee to UN ambassador. And uh, Linda Greenfield Thomas, she is a career uh, foreign service officer. Um, we've talked before on the podcast about Confucius Institutes. Conf yeah. Confucius Institutes are owned and controlled and paid for by the Chinese Communist government. They have been opened up at U.S. universities all across the country, and they serve as hubs for espionage, hubs for propaganda. Um, there's actually been pretty wide bipartisan agreement that Confucius Institutes are really bad and really harmful. So a couple of years ago, I wrote legislation uh, that, that passed, had big bipartisan support passed into law, clamping down on Confucius Institute. The bill I wrote has ended up shutting down dozens of Confucius Institutes across the country. Well, a little over a year ago, Biden's UN ambassador nominee gave a paid speech at a Confucius Institute. She got paid $1,500 to give a speech I questioned her at the hearing about it, and it's interesting. She backed away from it and said, oh, it was a mistake, and, and she, was, she was horrified, just horrified mm. to see what the Confucius Institute was doing, to, to which I responded, well, did you keep the money? And, and she was like, well, well, yeah, of course I kept the money, <laughs> but I was horrified. And, and I will also note the speech she gave so she handed the speech over to the Foreign Relations Committee. It's handed over to context that it's deemed confidential. So I have a copy of the speech. Hmm. She doesn't say one critical word about China. So she goes to a Confucius Institute and gives this puff piece praising China, praising the Belt and Road Initiative, which is billions of dollars that China is investing in infrastructure in the developing world, trying to make developing countries captive economically to China. And not only that, her speech says America should be more like communist China. We ought to have similar policies to what they have. This is who Joe Biden has picked to be the representative for the United States of America at the United Nations. We are in the midst of and getting ready to see a massive pivot back towards China, and that's really bad for the country. In a way, it, I'm, I'm sorry that I have to say this. It's, it seems like a return to normal. You know, we're talking about this kind of crooked establishment, and you see, you see it in stories as disparate as the, the GameStop sort of kerfuffle, and you see it all the way in foreign policy. Which you're seeing a return to this old 
consensus. Uh, it's it's pretty ugly, and they are they are exercising political power right now. We will have to discuss how we can exercise our freedom and push back against that power. We'll be discussing it in Miami on Friday, February 5th. I've got a whole bunch of mailbag questions. Unfortunately, we're out of time now. I will bring these mailbag questions with me to Miami. We will get your questions live if you go to youtube.com slash gaff TV. We might see you in person there. Senator, I certainly, I at least will see you in person there. Very much looking forward to it. And that's just assuming that the big establishment doesn't clamp down on us before then. But ho- hopefully, hopefully we'll at least get a week and we will see all of you in Miami. I'm Michael Knowles. This is Verdict with Ted Cruz. 